Come to the Liberation Theologians Network meeting if you're looking for pseudo epigrapha or some uh, beautiful <laughs> question that probably will not be solved here. So uh, make sure you're in the right room. Welcome to everybody. We're so delighted that you could join us. Um, this group started in 1995. So that means we're almost 20 years old, uh, a little older than Elizabeth and I are together, but that's, uh, <laughs> we're getting there. Um, we have been meeting faithfully and fruitfully since then, and we're so glad to have each and every one of you with us today. We've had many, many, many people in this circle over the long years, and it's great to have each of you here with us today. Uh, one of the ways in which we keep in touch with each other during the interim is to use a Google list, and Kelly, has the uh, sign-up sheets, and if you would please uh, pass those around Kelly and make sure that they get back to Kelly, uh, and sign your name and your email address, and we will put you on the Google list, which will get you both the notes from this meeting, as well as subsequent mailings from the Feminist Liberation Theologians Network. And people tell me that it is a useful mailing list to be on because you get notice of things that you might not find anywhere else. Uh, feel free to use that list if you're on it to send out notices of your own that you think would be useful for people who have our common interest. Thanks. In recent years, the Feminist Liberation Theologians Network has taken a critical look at the words feminist, liberation, and theology. And we have looked at the successes and the challenges in implementing and maintaining feminist liberation theology programs around the world in academic institutions and in other settings. Several of our sessions have been published in the Journal of Feminist Studies and Religion. So uh, these sessions not only have the life that happens in this room, but they have a life beyond this room. We've also begun to video the sessions, and uh, Emily Cohen will be videoing today. If you do not want to be in the video, please let us know, and we'll make sure that you're uh, cut out when we, um, when we uh, Yes, we have to do our hair first, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that you <laughs> We'll record it, but we'll make sure that your image is taken out of your so If your agent has a problem or whatever. <laughs> um, on your chairs are the flyers from the Women's Alliance for Theology, Ethics, and Ritual, or WATER, which is where I work and which is the sponsoring uh, organization for this event. So, um, last year we looked with some of our colleagues at how earlier folks uh, in this field had helped to shape our own thinking about concepts and ideas that we're working on today. And now we want to look, as it emerged last year, at issues of violence and particularly at anti-violence work. And it emerged out of a discussion of what really is a central concern for many of us in different countries around the world and in different settings. Gender-based violence as part of feminist liberation theological practices. So that's our focus today. And I'm especially happy to be <coughs> collaborating in this meeting, not only with Elizabeth and Fiorenza, with whom I have collaborated from the beginning on this project, but also in a special way with Marie Fortune from the Faith Trust Institute, uh, which I think is the go-to place for issues of religion and sexual domestic violence. So uh, with that kind of introduction, let me simply say that we're delighted to have you, and I will say now a word about how we proceed in our meeting, and then we will get right to the content. Uh, before I do that, I'd like to just read a very brief comment from one of our friends who couldn't be here. Her name is Monica Maher. And she said, I'm very glad, some of you know Monica, she's living in Honduras. And she said, I, I'm so glad that the network is pursuing this topic. I look forward to hearing how it goes and watching the video when you post it. I wanted to let you know that I will be there in spirit. A colleague, Margarita Murillo, was murdered less than three months ago in San Pedro Sula in Honduras. And last month, the woman lawyer following the case was also murdered. No. Clearly, the killing of women is on the rise around the world. The theological resources and voices are urgently needed. Gracias for this work and what you're doing on it. Peace and hugs from Monica Maher. I thought that was a way of setting the tone this afternoon for how serious these issues are and to bring to mind those women who have been killed and others who have been injured. So, 
this is a place where, unlike the rest of the ARSBL, you do not look at the back of someone's head, and you don't simply come unnoticed, but you are part of the meeting. So what we'll do in the first instance, except for that little back row, <laughs> sneak out early. Feel free to move in. Um, what we'll do is we'll introduce ourselves very briefly, uh, simply our names, maybe our location and a struggle that we're involved with. And then, since everybody's going to do that, you have to be very brief. Then Elizabeth Schuster Fiorenza will introduce our speakers, who will have seven or eight minutes to make their presentations on this question of gender-based violence, especially in theological education, how we're dealing with it, what are some of the resources, what is a mapping of that, what's happening around the world. Then we'll have an opportunity to meet together in small groups and have a quick uh, conversation with folks that you might want to talk with or that uh, are working in similar, on similar issues. And then we'll finish up by 6 o'clock uh, with a plenary around 5.30. So uh, I think with that agenda, we will pack it in for two hours. But I think you'll find that it's very well worth your time. And probably a more pleasant and humane experience than you'll have for the next three days of your life. So <laughs> this is the place to be. Um, again, I ask you to be brief um, about yourself and so we can hear from each and every one and to sign the sign-up sheet so that we know who's here. Um, finally, I want to announce before we uh, get started with the content again that the folks from the Women's Caucus have very um, happily and kindly decided that they will bring this work to their meeting tomorrow morning. And uh, I see Teresa Ugar and Elizabeth is here and others. And so there will be several people who are here from the Women's Caucus listening and participating who will then bring a report to the caucus tomorrow morning. So if you want to continue the discussion of what happens here, the Women's Caucus will meet tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Uh, that is in the convention center in room 14A. And I promise you it's difficult to find because it's on the mezzanine. But if you uh, study tonight, you can figure out how to get to the mezzanine. And um, it is a, it's a very important discussion, I think, tomorrow morning. I think Marie and I are going to be there. And we'll all have an opportunity to continue some of this conversation. So um, I'm Mary Hunt at Water. And I work on feminist issues in religion, both in terms of writing and organizing. Okay, Yeah, Rosemary Bradford Luther. I teach and write and I hang out in Claremont, California. I'm Christina Grenholm, Church of Sweden, Systematic Theology, Feminist Studies. I'm Katrin York, uh, Uppsala University. I uh, am uh, very much involved with uh, women's. Uh, Peace Movement, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, celebrating 100 years next year. A little louder, please. Yeah, as loud Women's as you can. Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, celebrating its 100th anniversary in the day, 2015. I'm Stefan Edling. I'm not a theologian, but I am a feminist, and I'm here with my friend, Dan Katrin. I'm Allie Lux. I'm a PhD student in Ethics and Society at Vanderbilt. Kathy McCallie. I teach Ethics at Phillips Theological Seminary in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Hi, I'm Nami Kim. I teach at Spelman College. I'm Elizabeth Tetley from Switzerland. Working in pastoral, yeah. pastoral work. Yeah. I'm Gabriel Perantini, companion of Elizabeth. And uh, I met her on feminist theological events. Mm -hmm. I am Catherine House, and I'm a doctoral student at Boston University School of Theology. Sochi Ranviso, also at Boston University in Practical Theology, work on feminist ecclesiology. I'm Cara Leaving, I'm a friend of order, and uh, I work in Melbourne with the Jewish Christian Muslim women. Sally Douglas, I've just completed my PhD looking at uh, early understandings of Jesus as the female divine, and I'm from Melbourne, and I'm a minister as well. Gina Messina Dyser from First Lane College and Feminism and Religion. Uh, Sarah Michelle Brickenberg of Mount St. Mary's College, Los Angeles. I'm Michelle Mueller. I'm a doctoral student at the Graduate Theological Union. On Tuesday, I'm giving a talk on feminists for and against SNM. Marcel Grano um, at the California Institute of Digital Studies, and I am working on women's organization. Misako Kimitawa from Tokyo, Japan. Would you mind checking the curtain? Is it the one back there? Yes, that one too. That's what Oh my god. <laughs> Thank 
Clarkson. Um, well, Thank I you. I taught at Yale and now I'm retired and see a lot of the uh, feminist team and international feminist team this year. Denise Natto, Concordia University, <coughs> Montreal, working on bias against indigenous women. <coughs> My name is Arendra Boucher Kirat. I'm a doctoral student at the University of Ottawa, and I'm uh, working in Aboriginal studies mainly and focusing on Aboriginal women. Speak as loudly as you can, please, so we can all hear you. Do you need me to repeat it? I think you're okay. Go ahead. Keep going. Yep. I'm Allison McKinney. I'm a human rights lawyer, and I focus on um, abuses affecting women and girls. I'm an MDiv student at Yale Divinity School. And my current activist work is around campus sexual assault. I'm Renate Joost, and I'm professor for feminist theology in Bavaria, Germany. I'm Denise Starkey. I'm a member of the Board of Trustees for the Big Trust Institute and a professor and I'm chair of the theology department at the College of St. Scholastica. I'm Jane Fredrickson, and I'm with Faith Trust Institute. Hi, I'm Angela Parker. I am a PhD student candidate. Um, well, just turned in my dissertation. All right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Chicago Theological Seminary working on womanist study on the Gospel of Mark. Mm. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm Dana Densmore, and uh, I've worked on uh, gender violence generally. I'm new, new here to this. Group. And where are you from? And, and I'm from uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. My home institution is St. John's College, and I'm also a uh, doctoral candidate in um, women and Judaism at the uh, University of Wales. Hi, I'm Carrie Whipple. I'm a doctoral student at Drew University, working in New Testament, specifically in Revelation, and working on issues of violence against women. Lisa Beth White, a doctoral student at Boston University, doing my work from my home in uh, suburban Houston, Texas. <laughs> Amy Goff, I work for Church World Service, looking at gender justice and humanitarian work, and also I'm here representing the We Will Speak Out Coalition. Marvin Ellison, I'm on staff of Union Theological Seminary in New York, and I'm working on a reproductive justice project with the Center for American Progress. Maria Pilar Aquino, I'm here from the University of San Diego, working with feminist theologians in Latin America and also at the World, World Forum on Theology and Liberation. My name is Ina Marjanova, I'm based currently at Trinity College Dublin. I'm a sociologist of religion, not a theologian. Can you speak louder, please? We can hear you. I am a sociologist of religion, not a theologian, but mm -hmm. I'm interested in how you interpret uh, the topic of violence from a theological perspective. From Bulgaria. Where are you from? I'm originally from Bulgaria. Uh-huh. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> I'm Sharon Ellis Davis. I'm from Chicago, Illinois, now living in um, North Carolina. I teach at McCormick Theological Seminary in Chicago. I'm a pastor emeritus for the United Church of Christ, and a retired Chicago police officer. And I work Ooh. specifically <laughs> with uh, sexual and domestic violence, especially as it relates to African-American women, as it intersects with race, class, and gender in the criminal justice system. I'm Dorothy Rupert. I teach at the University of Colorado in Boulder. I teach in the area of civic engagement, using democracy as a tool for positive social change. Um, I was a legislator for many years in Colorado legislature in the House and the Senate, where I did a lot of work on um, feminist, well, particularly I passed one of the early laws on female gender mutilation, uh, making it uh, actually a um, a felony in Colorado. If anyone wants to talk to me, I'd be glad to talk to you about it. And uh, quite a few other issues. I started teaching in 1948, so I've had um, a long history of working with young people and young women. I'm Nancy Corcoran. I'm the Catholic chaplain at Wellesley College. <coughs> I'm Emily Cohen, and I'm at Harvard Divinity School studying Buddhist, Buddhist ministry and gender. Um, and I was previously at Faith Trust Institute and Water. Um, Kelly Stewart, I work at a battery intervention program in Massachusetts. I'm originally from Alabama. Right. I'm, I'm Janine Vio, and I teach uh, religious studies and humanities at the University of Central Florida. 
I'm Elizabeth Ersick. I teach uh, religious studies at Mesa Community College. My first book on called Women, Ritual, and Power, Placing Female Imagery of God in Christian Worship mm. has just come out with SUNY Press. And I am co-chair of the Women's Caucus, mm. and we are presiding over tomorrow morning's continuation of this conversation. So uh, we invite you all to come. I'm Nancy Neenhouse at uh, Andover Newton Theological School. Hi, Nami. <laughs> this is like old home week. <laughs> um, and I teach uh, future clergy so that uh, about domestic violence so they can be resources instead of roadblocks. Yeah. I'm Catherine Common. Um, I am a doctoral student in feminist practical theology at Boston University and also on the Committee for the Women's Caucus. My name is Teresa Ugar, and I'm co-chair for the Women's Caucus. I'm a graduate of Claremont Graduate University in Women's Studies with a specialty in gender and colonial Latin American history. And I'm very happy because I have my book, <laughs> Sir Juana Inez and I Cruz, um, 17th Century fem Prototypical Feminists and I, Ar I Argue Echo Feminists. So I have like, I have 50 of them. So if you would like to buy them, <laughs> you can buy them. <laughs> My name is uh, Ulrike Auger and I teach theology and gender studies at Humboldt University in Berlin. Uh, I'm interested in uh, biopolitics and religion and uh, most currently also interested in astrobiology and religion. Yeah. I'm uh, Israel Schuller at the University of Winchester where I teach feminist liberation uh, theologies. My interest are in sexuality, gender and in fact eco-feminism and the new cosmology. I'm Megan Clay, um, I live in the UK, I'm a fellow of the University of Winchester, um, and I work in feminist liberation theologies and art. I'm Elisabeth Kovac, I'm from Berlin too, and I'm interested in postcolonial issues as well as in queer and uh, gender theory. Hi, Kalina Phillips. I'm a sociologist of religion from the University of Newcastle, New South Wales, Australia. Currently doing a very big project on um, gender violence in the Catholic Church and attending the Royal Commission into Child Sexual Abuse, mm. which is currently in the University of Australia. Mm. I'm Janice Stoos, and I'm a recent uh, graduate, got a PhD from the University of Den Joint Program of the University of Denver and Isla School of Theology. And, uh, in working in the area of uh, religion and media, and uh, I'm presently in pastoral work in Flint, Michigan. And I'm Deborah Niederer Saxon. I've just uh, moved from being in the same program as Jan to Indianapolis, and I'm teaching at the University of Indianapolis, <coughs> mostly undergrads, all of whom now know that Mary Magdalene was the first apostle. of <laughs> 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 God with feminine imagery, which they're not really very sure about. <laughs> I'm Jennifer Bird. I live in Portland, Oregon. I'm adjuncting right now. Um, my my interest in particular here, my dissertation, I focused on um, a passage in First Peter that addresses or perhaps leads lends to um, sexual abuse and violence and fear and all kinds of great things like that from scripture. So that's my interest biblically. And I'm also currently doing trying to do a lot of work with churches and talking about the. Um, marriage equality issues, starting at, starting with what the Bible actually says about marriage, and then let's work from there. So Hi, I'm Joseph Marshall. I teach feminist post <coughs> and uh, queer approaches to biblical interpretation at Ball State University. I'm Elaine Wainwright, and I'm at the uh, University of Auckland, and currently I'm working on two commentaries on the Gospel of Matthew, the Earth Bible commentary, and also the Wisdom of the New Wisdom commentary. Mm. I'm Kathleen Rushton from Christchurch, New Zealand. I teach New Testament in the Catholic Institute of New Zealand. I'm Elizabeth Dowling, and I teach at Australian Catholic University in Biblical Studies. I'm Satoko Yamaguchi from Tokyo. I'm a co director of the Centre for Feminist Theology and Ministry in the Philippines. My name is Gillian Breckenridge. I'm originally from the UK, at, currently at the University of Virginia. I'm a PhD candidate in theology, ethics, and culture. Um, looking at my field is basically systematic theology and critical theory, critical social theory. Um, I also uh, 
run a student ministry program in the school church at UVA. Hi, I'm Lynn Cooper. Um, I'm the Catholic chaplain at Tufts. It's nice to be here. <laughs> I'm Paula Trimble Famoletti, retired kindergarten teacher, graduate of Shannon Clarkson and Letty Russell's Doctor of Ministry in International Feminist Theology and author of the book released in June, Prostitutes, Virgins, and Mothers, Questioning Teachings About Biblical Women. Mm -hmm. uh, I am Elizabeth Trusla Fiorenza, and I have the honor to uh, introduce our distinguished speakers. But before I do so, I want to invite all of you uh, for tonight we have, we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Journal of Family Studies in Religion. And there is a reception in the Point Loma room here in, in this hotel. So, what, what time? Tonight. Nine o'clock tonight. Forget that. <laughs> we have to speak up because it's, the hard part is we're trying to to include everyone, but it's hard to hear certain quadrants of the room. So. Is this better? Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, Dr. Solveig uh, Anna Bortz, here, is professor of theology and religious studies, uh, university where she is is Dean of the Theological Faculty. She has lectured widely in the Nordic countries. Her interest in anti-violence work, her commitment to explore creative pedagogy, and her critical feminist perspective overlap as she develops continuing education as well as master's and doctoral level classes. She is the author of Violence, Power, and Justice, a feminist contribution to Christian sexual ethics, and has served on the board of the Journal of Religion and Abuse. The Reverend Dr. Marie Fortune received her seminary training at Yale Divinity School and was ordained a minister in the United Church of Christ in 1976. After serving in a local parish, she founded the Center for the Preventive Prevention of Sexual and Domestic Violence, now known as Face Plus Institute, in 1977, where she served as executive director until 1999. Now she serves as founder and senior analyst at Face Plus Institute, a multi faith multicultural organization in the U.S., providing religious communities and advocates with training consultation and educational materials to address the face aspects of abuse. She is the <coughs> author of Sexual Violence, The Sin Revisited, um, in, in, uh, Keeping the Face, Questions and Answers for Christians Abused Women, is uh, Nothing Sacred, and Love Does No Harm. She has served on the National Advisory Committee for the Office on Violence Against Women in the U.S. Department of Justice and on the Defense Task Force on Domestic Violence in the U.S. Department of Defense. She edited the Journal of Religion and Abuse from 2000 to 2008. Ms. Elizabeth Azibo Okundi uh, is uh, a preacher and scholar. She is from Kenya, and her commitment to social justice is deeply influenced by the faithful and informed activism of the family. Siva Okundi has earned degrees in Black Studies, African Studies, Divinity, and Theology. Her scholarship and sermons have been published in several academic journals and books, including the three-volume Preaching God's Transforming Justice, a lectionary commentary. Uh, Ms. Sibo Okundi has preached in numerous settings, served as a pastor, and she is a PhD candidate in practical theology and homiletics at uh, Boston University. Last but not least, my colleague, Reverend Dr. Tracy West, 
is professor in, uh, uh, of ethics and African American studies at Drew University Theological School. She is the author of Disruptive Christian Ethics, When Racism and Women's Lives Matter. Wounds of the Spirit, Black Women Violence and Resistance Ethics, and the editor of Our Family Values, Same-Sex Marriage and Religion. She is an ordained elder in the New York Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church, who is with previously served in campus and parish ministry in the Hartford, uh, Connecticut area. She is a member of the United Methodists of Color for a fully inclusive church, and she is the co-editor of the Journal of Feminist Studies. <laughs> so I was told all of you have eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, so much for inviting me to this meeting, and it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you today. Uh, <clears throat> I come from a very small community and academic environment. The population of Iceland is about 320,000. And the National Public Research University of Iceland in Reykjavik has 14,000 students. The theological faculty has all in all 100 students. 70% of them are women. And we have six full-time working teachers at our faculty, and two of them are women. The Icelandic society can be characterized as a highly modern one. The past few years, Iceland has topped the list of World Economic Forum as the country in the world with the greatest gender equality. However, in Iceland, we have got all the same problems that everybody else in the world. Gender based violence being just one. As a feminist ethicist teaching and working in the field of theology for almost 20 years, I have found issues of justice and social responsibility in the classroom equally important in society, as in society. And I understand feminist theology to be a great resource and a marvelous tool in that matter. I even dare to say that this is my experience in my small theological classes. The past three years, the University of Iceland has made a survey on student satisfaction with their study programs. And our small faculty, 100 persons, uh, which is uh, one out of 25 faculties at the whole university. But the surprising thing is that this little faculty stands out in comparison to the others with regard to how students respond to the following three statements. One, the study program has strengthened my ethical judgment. Two, the study program has strengthened my consciousness of my responsibility for my community. And third, the study program has strengthened my consciousness of equality. Most of the students at our theological faculty strongly agree with these three statements compared to up to 25% of the of the students from the other faculties. So hopefully this tells us something little about what is going on in our small classes. Now motivation and inspiration in my teaching has of course come from many <coughs> different feminists and feminist pedagogical books, not least Bell Hooks and Rebecca Job. I, wa I want to mention them. Hooks point that everything we do in life is rooted in theory, explains in my view 
well how feminist theory has as its primary goal to explain to women and men how sexist thinking works as well as how it can be challenged and changed. Uh, in, uh, in her talk with uh, uh, Ron Chap in Teaching to Transgress, she talks about how to build a teaching community as well as issues of liberatory practices in the classroom and of coming to voice. And I must say that I have learned so much and applied so much from her and from other writers and my whole thinking <laughs> and teaching is really informed and inspired by this <coughs> kind of critical thinking and through that I have tried to recognize the students as powerful thinkers too, powerful agents able to question and challenge the oppressing structures in our social and religious traditions and culture. Of course, we all work within somewhat different contexts and situations, depending on our culture and society, and our, uh, and our teaching situation are there somewhat different too, which shapes our responses and suggestions to change. Still, I think it is essential not to forget that feminists in theological research and teaching have not much in common in the struggle against gender-based violence. And like Bell Hooks said so well 30 years ago, and I quote, the foundation of future feminist struggle must be solidly based on a recognition of the need to eradicate and the underlying cultural basis and causes of sexism and other forms of group oppression. Without challenging and changing these philosophical structures, no feminist reforms will have a long-range impact." Unquote. I think that I can say that I have taken these words seriously in my research context as well as in classrooms. Anybody who engages in fighting gender-based violence in whatever context needs to grasp the bigger picture of both structural and cultural violence. Patriarchal violence, which is a concept that Hooks uses, expresses how gender-based violence is connected to sexism and sexist thinking in our culture. I am in agreement with Hooks when I say that in our theological classroom context, we need a good theory, and thus an inclusive concept of violence when discussing gender-based violence with our students. Our resources for doing so come from feminist theology and feminist theory. Working toward social change and social justice in theological education, we need feminist theoro theoretical insights regarding the interrelationship or the cross-breeding between personal and individual violence and structural gender injustice in society. Critical analysis is needed in order to understand how structural violence is produced and reproduced by hundreds, thousands, and millions of persons usually acting within institutional rules and social practices that most people regard as morally acceptable. Here I am referring to Iris Marion Young's brilliant thoughts, thinking that we need to apply a social connection model of responsibility in our theological classes, which stress, stresses that individuals bear responsibility for structural injustice because they contribute by their actions to the processes that produce unjust outcomes. As theological teachers, we have the responsibility to critically discuss cultural violence with our students as the source for gender-based violence. And as for cultural violence, we have 
great resources to challenge the thought patterns which have ruled for much too long within theology as within other things. Thank you. questions that I ask myself frequently is how can the experience that is so common among us not be on the agenda of theological education? <laughs> the experiences of um, sexual and domestic violence and its various forms and contexts. And every time I come to AAR, I'm like looking for <laughs> the discussion and not seeing it. Um, so that's my fundamental question. So I just want to test that, my theory, my concern. Uh, how many of you in this room have a friend or colleague whom you know is a survivor of sex or domestic violence? Keep your hands up. A family member, you yourself, So, thank you. What's interesting, I do this whenever I go into a church or uh, other setting, um, and it's the same story. There's no surprise that, and the statistics would tell us that. So, I think it's a fundamental question in theological education at this point in time. How is this not on the bigger agenda of theological education. So that's why we're here, is to help move that forward. A little bit of history, uh, I think, is always helpful. <clears throat> and uh, my history uh, goes back to my seminary training at Yale Divinity School, where I just want to say I had an excellent education and received no training uh, to help me address uh, my ministry of uh, working on sexual and domestic violence. And one of the interesting stories that I remember in conversation with Margaret Farley, who was my ethics professor at the time there, when I went back uh, some years later to visit, and we were chatting, and, um, and she said that among the students who returned from ministry to talk about how things were going out in the field, that she would always ask them, uh, what are you finding out there that we did not prepare you for? And she said, consistently, the most common response was incest. <coughs> now, I was surprised by that. But that's data. That's important data in terms of what's going on in local congregations where we supposedly are training some of our folks to do ministry. Um, <coughs> In my first parish uh, experience, I would raise issues of sexual and domestic violence in conversation, and generally the response that I got was uh, people would drop their heads. Uh, I knew what things that were going on, but it, there was not an open conversation. I was also being trained then as a volunteer at the Rape Crisis Center in Seattle, which is where I got my real training to address uh, issues of survivor, survivors of violence. And there, whenever I would work with a, a victim or survivor, I would, and, and if she asked um, what I did, and I would say that I was a pastor, um, invariably, then that's what she wanted to talk about. And so what I was experiencing literally was that gap between the reality of people's lives uh, that the church wasn't able to talk about and the reality of the agencies who were doing their best to try to respond, but who also were not prepared to address any kind of faith issues. So that was the gap um, that uh, drew me into this ministry of Faith Trust Institute. In the 80s, we began to hear the stories from survivors of sexual abuse by clergy as that whole piece of our realities began to emerge in a very big way. And so we have been responding to that uh, ever since. And one of the pieces of work that we took up in the seminary context was 
to, to invite uh, faculty and administrators from seminaries to training so that we might help equip them to go back and deal with curriculum, but also to deal with policy and practices on campus regarding um, healthy boundaries and abuse in those situations. And we had the opportunity to train uh, people from 75 of the 225 ATS seminaries uh, to carry that work forward. There, there has been progress, at least for those of us who've been around long enough, one of the advantages is to be able, well, we can say the world is different than it was uh, when we started asking these questions. Thanks be to God. Um, and some of you may be familiar with the Sojourner uh, article uh, this past uh, July where they had a, a survey uh, of Protestant pastors. And one of the things they found was that 56% of Protestant pastors were in fact speaking about sexual and domestic violence in their congregations, which I actually thought was terrific <laughs> given what I've seen over the years in terms of the absence of that conversation. That, for me, is a measure of, of progress. Um, but I visit a lot of seminaries, and so I talk to a lot of you who are teaching and working in those settings. And um, so, and that's one of the things that I'm concerned about in this conversation. And particularly um, 15 years ago, uh, as as we were engaged in those conversations. I began to identify people who were writing and doing research in the field. And there was no real forum for that. And so that's when we established the Journal on Religion and Abuse as a, a journal forum uh, for both scholars and practitioners, because we really wanted to bring together the work um, that both were doing. And uh, we produced that journal for eight years until there was literally a lull in that writing and research. It just started to fall away. I have no idea why, um, but it did, and so basically the journal went away uh, at that point in time. But in seminaries now, uh, where you are teaching and working and doing research, uh, my question for you is, is what do you need uh, at this point to help you do your work? For those of us who sit out in the field and in the, the world of faith communities, uh, we're concerned about those of you who help to prepare people for ministry, whether in congregations or chaplaincies or specialized ministries, and how you can provide for them uh, the basics. My assumption is that people in ministry out in the field need to be generalists around these issues. Uh, but they need to understand what we call domestic and sexual violence 101. You know, what it is, why it happens, what's going on here. So they can even see it and understand it when it emerges. But also to prepare them to address the faith issues that emerge for victim survivors and perpetrators. Uh, also a focus on research and writing. I mean, you know, there's so many research projects that I would love to hand off to graduate students. Um, I mean, there's so much we don't know in terms of the, the life of the faith community around these issues that we desperately need that information. But also the focus on the issues within the seminary communities um, and uh, whether internal to the seminary or the university where the seminary is particularly now addressing sexual assault as it has emerged in the states as a significant campus issue. Uh, and, and where are we providing leadership uh, on those issues within our settings? But also the issues of faculty misconduct and boundaries within the seminary setting is part of that discussion that uh, I, I'm only hearing a little bit about it but a need, definitely the need is there. And then uh, the importance of teaching uh, around these issues as a multidisciplinary effort. The integration of the curriculum. This is not, uh, the concerns of gender-based violence in people's lives are, is not a concern that's a little special issue over here. <laughs> that, you know, 
you include two weeks in a <laughs> semester long course and you're done, or a workshop or whatever. And I'm sure most of you know that in your experiences. But somehow this has to be part of uh, biblical studies, preaching, ethics, pastoral care, theology. Uh, every part of theological education has an opportunity to speak to these issues. And when we do that, then it becomes part of what we're doing, uh, whether we're preparing scholars or pastors. And I think that's, that's where I would like to see us going. <clears throat> And certainly part of that is encouraging young scholars uh, in their work to begin to pick that up. And, and I do have to say, in the last three to four years, um, as I move around and meet people, I'm delighted to see um, some young scholars who are going to do this work. And so I'm not at all worried about the future of that. I want to encourage and support you in any way that, that I can and that we can if they trust. So one of the things in doing this uh, panel today is that uh, on your uh, chair you have the, this purple thing, which is basically a survey asking you to talk about what you need, what would be helpful in your work. Tell us what your work is and tell us what would be helpful to you. Um, we're hopeful that out of this gathering and tomorrow morning's gathering, we'll begin to get a sense of, you know, is there uh, potential for a network, some way that we can be in touch with each other, that we can share the work that we're doing um, in terms of uh, syllabi, curriculum, and so forth and so on. So that's what this is for. So if uh, before you leave today, if you have time and could fill this out, just give us some some uh, information on this and leave it with um, Allie McKinney in the sort of red shirt, uh, Emily Cohen, who's filming, or Kelly next to her, they are our collectors, uh, or leave it in your chair and we'll pick it up. But that's, you know, we want to hear from you on these issues. Does anybody need one? Everybody get Is it, are there extras somewhere? Yeah, there are extras. Yeah, we need some over here, I think. Okay, some extras? Anybody else? <laughs> Thank you. being here today, making it safely. I thank those who came before us. I thank the one I run to. I also thank my family and friends, and also Dr. Shisla Fiorenza, Dr. Hunt, for inviting me here today, as well as my co-panelists and you for being here. I would like to think together about a new way of thinking, a new way of thinking. I believe that theological education should teach students and leaders to move beyond that which is comfortable and easy and predictable. Hmm. However, when it comes to theological education and gender-based violence, we tend to go in ways that are very predictable. We ignore it. We organize a worship service during Women's Month, of course. <laughs> we hold a town hall meeting only when a sexual assault has occurred on campus or one of our community members has done something that is ethically not sound. Or if we're really progressive, we offer a course, an elective course. <laughs> And the result is that theological institutions and students can simply go down a checklist and easily check off the box marked gender-based violence and then comfortably say, we've dealt with gender-based violence. <laughs> we offered the course, our students took it. We held a town hall meeting and our students attended the meeting. We arranged a worship service, and our students participated in the worship service. We have dealt with gender-based violence. But if we are to take seriously this idea that 
Theological education should teach students and leaders to move beyond that which is comfortable and predictable and easy. Then we begin to understand that addressing gender-based violence is not about a meeting, it's not about a service, it's not even about a course. Instead, it's about a curriculum that invites us into a new way of thinking. A way of thinking that integrates gender-based violence and issues of violence across the curriculum. And so simply checking a box becomes insufficient. We need a new way of thinking and a new way of acting. And I suggest that theological education ought to consider at least four areas. Whatever theological education does, first we need to do it boldly. We need to do it boldly. And I'll use examples from my field of homiletics that for us as preachers, we ought to preach boldly. And oftentimes we are just simply scared to do it. We don't want to say the wrong thing. We don't want to offend anybody. And so we are a bit timid. We are a bit shy. We don't do what we need to do as preachers. But the reality is the same fear that prevents us from preaching about violence against women and girls is the same fear that allows and strengthens a perpetrator's boldness while threatening to imprison our own boldness. So whatever we do with theological education, we must do it boldly across the curriculum. I also put forth that we must do it truthfully. And in preaching, we have to acknowledge how particular scriptures are used to manipulate people, and also how do they sound to people who are in violent situations and those who are perpetrators themselves. Take, for example, Matthew 5, 9. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. Hmm. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other one also. Or take Matthew 6, 14 through 15. For if you <coughs> forgive others your trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, meaning your perpetrators perhaps, neither will your Father forgive you. And perhaps we've heard Matthew 21, 22, whatever you ask for in prayer with faith, you will receive it. God, please change this situation. Please change him. Please change her. If only you believed enough, then the situation will change. We need to preach truthfully. We need to have theological education that seeks the truth, that exposes the truth, that shows students and leaders how to find the truth and how to put it out there in a way that is truthful. But we also need to do this in a way that is loving. We need to preach lovingly. And what does that mean? That we have victims, survivors, we have people who have perpetrated violence against others, we also have <coughs> bystanders. And our messengers have to reach all of them. We may for a moment feel as though we hate the one who has done something, but that one is still part of the community. Some people are in violent situations and they're sitting right next to the person who is abusing them. And they are in church services or in the synagogues looking at you, looking at us, the theologically educated ones, the formally theologically educated ones, to give a word of hope and a word of truth but it's all of the people, all of the categories who are looking to us. So we must preach lovingly. And lastly, whatever it is that theological education does, it must do so faithfully. And this is one of the reasons why having a one-time course or event or meeting is insufficient. Because everything that we say or do is an extension of what we believe, what we teach, and what we preach. One time is not enough. It can be a start, but it is not enough. We also need the follow through. We need the response, and we need to be ready for the response. To preach one time, who is going to be there to be able to offer support to those who so desperately need it? And another reason why we have to be so faithful in doing it 
is that throughout the year, we may actually be preaching and teaching things that are against what we claim to believe when it comes to issues of gender-based violence. A God who is loving one day and violent the next. A God who is loving during Women's History Month, but very, very threatening and evil the rest of the year. How can that be? One time is not enough. Whatever theological education does, it has to do so faithfully. And so I leave you with this thought that raises this question. These elements of being bold, being truthful, being loving, being faithful, are our theological institutions courageous enough to do this? Whatever it is that we claim to do in our theological education, we have to do it with courage. And so before the peace comes the courage. And if we want to move beyond the comfortable, easy, and predictable places, we ought to do it. And if we are not, then why not? conversations that we will continue to have uh, here at this meeting and hopefully beyond. Uh, I want to just say briefly something about uh, what works well in my own teaching on this topic and uh, what I find challenging and then just give uh, an example of one uh, experience that I had teaching in Zimbabwe. Oops. I knew I was going to do that. Thank you. I think that what works, what works well in my teaching on uh, gender-based violence is to include this topic in an integrated way. So to, if I am talking about, uh, I teach in a seminary context, so if I'm talking about clergy, uh, uh, conduct, it, conduct issues, so confidentiality, and I might be having a discussion about what constitutes uh, a, a, a confidential, something that's shared confidentially. I know for many of us, um, we're having to kind of up our game and include uh, lots and lots of internet exchanges, right, virtual exchanges as part of our conversations about confidentiality. And to, uh, and to help students to think about what does it mean for someone to reveal something that's violence that has occurred in, over the net through email in a way that perhaps uh, you can tap into, um, that, that, that that might be vulnerable to someone being able to see it. Um, whether it's just a family member, uh, the perpetrator searching their history, or it could be how vulnerable is the church's um, um, uh, email access. Or sometimes I might be just talking about, uh, this is just a, this is a, a, a web example, I might be talking about how do you set up a, a, a page for your nonprofit organization where you have photos of I don't know, the picnic that occurred, uh, the supper, or the, self, the fundraiser. Um, what does it mean if there is someone who it has a restraining order or who is trying to um, hide from an abuser? And what does it mean if their picture goes up on the web? Um, or if I might be having a conversation uh, about, what, about the ethics of preaching. Uh, and I might say, what if someone ha you've been in conversation with someone about uh, violence that has occurred, a, a range of violence. It, it could be a young person who, ha who had a, a, a date rape situation. And then you get up in the pulpit and you start to talk about sexual violence. Are there issues of confidentiality? Does that person feel like you have violated their trust by you bringing up this subject? Um, the challenge for me is no matter what I am talking about or what I am teaching, to help the students to see the relevance of, of these kinds of issues. If I'm talking about um, medical ethics and 
uh, reproductive issues, to bring up the issue of rape, for example, and to say, what difference does it make if pregnancy occurs as a result of rape in your discussion of reproductive choice issues? And uh, who, in, in heterosexual, in, if, in, is there coercion in heterosexual marriage? And if there is a coercion, coercive sex ha, ha, has resulted in pregnancy, what are the issues around reproductive choice? Um, how does that impact the way in which you, 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 you uh, take those into consideration? You know, so those kinds of examples of a wide range of topics to see that there's an integrated understanding of gender-based violence. Um, what, what doesn't work so well, I just would just really briefly mention is, I, I don't feel that I am able to address uh, timely issues, such as the NFL scandal. I don't feel that I, I can have the kind of complicated conversation about race and the media and about masculinity and about sports in a way that's in-depth and provides the students with the models that they need. Um, sometimes it's just probably because of my committee load. Um, that I just don't have a chance to say, okay, we've got to have work on this uh, because it's in the news every day. Um, and then I just want to mention briefly my current interest in transnational intercultural learning and, uh, and what does it mean uh, to try and have a transnational intercultural conversation. And uh, just, just a brief example of I was teaching this past year in January at Africa University in Zimbabwe, and I taught, co taught a course with uh, Maretso Mutambara, and together we taught about a range of topics. Um, and the students included, I brought my, drew students who were US. U.S. students as well as students from South Korea. The U.S. students included white Midwestern students to um, African American New York City students uh, to students who were uh, from South Korea, mainly from the Seoul area, area although some, some, uh, some rural, one student from a rural area as well. In the, and then we sat alongside of students from Africa University who were from Angola, Sierra Leone, Zimbabwe of course, Kenya, uh, Nigeria, Demo Democratic Republic of the Congo. So I'm just trying to get you to see that this is a very, very diverse classroom uh, by nation, state, and culture. And and one of my, we discussed uh, rape in marriage and domestic violence within heterosexual relationships and the targeting of lesbians for rape and murder. Those were among the issues that we discussed when we were talking about gender and family. My goal is to try to find ways to for students to learn about violence in our different, my goal was not, was not to encourage the students to learn about violence in their differing cultural settings. I was not trying to get the students to say, oh, let me hear what happens in your setting. Okay, and let me tell you what happens in my setting. I was interested in trying to get the students to critically engage one another and challenge one another to become religious leaders. I wanted to encourage critical perspectives on culture and a shared sense of responsibility for ending the violence. Let me just say there were moments when I thought I am perpetuating more stereotypes than I am in fact breaking down. It was very, very challenging. And of course there were moments when I thought I am trying to hold back the tears because of the courage and the honesty and the depth at which these students are engaging these issues. How do I enable my students? Uh, and one example was I performed, how do I enable my students to, to confront the underlying gendered contri uh, con contributors to the violence without reinforcing racist stereotypes about Africans, without reinforcing stereotypes about U.S., uh, particularly U.S. women, um, and Christian paternalisms. So I literally role-played. I performed, uh, I, I was a Christian, cisgender, heterosexual, male abuser, and I role-played with the students from the very context, and, and, they, and they engaged me. So how to literally perform gender in the context of talking about abuse and allow them, which they did very critically to say, in my culture, no one would ever, a male would never say what you just said because. 
and to have the cultural piece be part of what it was we were working on confronting. Um, and so it challenged me to think about how um, this conversation also challenged me to think about how we, how a feminist, womanist embrace of masculinity in a discussion on, end, on ending gendered violence, particularly as we talked about <clears throat> the ways in which lesbians are tar lesbians who embrace a masculinity as part of their identity, embrace, celebrate, and that very embrace of masculinity is part of what is part of why they are targeted for violence, for rape, and for murder. And to give examples, both uh, from examples of activists I talked about, in the U I talked with in South Africa, and uh, examples of particular African Americans, Zakia Gunn and the New Jersey Four, who were uh, lesbians who were targeted here in the United States, black women who were targeted. And um, that was very, that's very challenging for me. What does it mean to have in this conversation of ending gender violence an embrace of masculinity um, in light of the fact that that is one of the ways in which uh, women are targeted, uh, lesbians are targeted for such brutal forms of violence. So I just sort of leave it there. Lots of conversations that I would like for us to have about what it means to truly learn from each other and critically challenge each other across uh, our cultural, varying cultural differences. Thank you very much. These were wonderful presentations, each one uh, rich in its own uh, in its own right, but taken together, I think a marvelous panel that really opens up our context now for discussion. I'd like to invite you to make small groups and really push to the corners of the room. Make your group um, four or five people at the most. Don't, don't go above five. And here, here's what we want to talk about. Given these rich and helpful presentations, what are you doing in your setting in terms of gender-based violence? And more importantly, what needs to be done? What resources do you have and what resources do you need to do that work? How can we connect with one another in these efforts and what strategies might emerge? So what we want to do is here, just as each one of our colleagues, and again, I thank Tracy and Elizabeth, I thank Marie and Solvig for these wonderful presentations. We want to hear a similar presentation from you in a very short form in your small groups and then we will have a plenary discussion to see where we can, how we can move forward sharing the resources in this room to continue to do uh, anti-violence, uh, to work on anti-violence work. Yeah. Yes, we'll just make one more. Sure. Elizabeth has an announcement. Um, uh, we have, uh, <laughs> can't, can't hear you. JFSR has this SDL uh, a session on sexual violence and sacred texts. Uh, on, uh, tomorrow at uh, one, between 1 and 3 soon. Great. Thank you. So, we'll take 15 minutes for the small groups, and then we'll come back for a plenary discussion, at which point there will be time to ask questions and make comments, but mostly we want to hear from you. So form your groups, and uh, let's get with it. Thank you again.